Thank you for joining us today for choosing the right DR architecture for Zerto. Uh, my name is James, I'm here from Data Barracks, and I'm joined today by Chris Rogers from, from Zerto, who I'll, I'll be handing over to to introduce himself and, and kind of take, take the reins from here. Um, but before we get started, we'll, we'll do a quick, very quick bit of housekeeping. Uh, so I got a kind of very, very fast intro and agenda of today. Uh, I want to answer the question that inevitably uh, everyone, everyone always asks on, on every webinar, and that is, yes, we are recording this session today, and we will be making the slides available. We'll, we'll send these all out after the session. Uh, we're scheduled for 30 minutes total, uh, uh, which does include a short, uh, a short time for some questions at the end. If you have any questions, type them all on the right-hand side in the panel. Uh, I'll be taking those and I'll, I'll, I'll put them to Chris uh, at, at the end of the session today. Um, and then just to answer, um, one, one thing I want to cover just before I hand over to Chris to kind of take the reins from here, which is uh, one, why, why, are we, uh, why, why have we chosen this topic for the webinar? And two, uh, kind of what, what our preference is and a little bit of disclosure about, about the, the type of service that, that, that we obviously recommend. Um, so to start with, the reason that we, that we, we chose this comes from a, a few months ago, I was looking at the, the calendar um, of the team internally here, and I saw one of our sales team had a session booked in with a, a, a prospective customer who were working on a tender, and the, the title of that particular meeting was literally uh, disaster recovery into our own data centers or using DRAS. And at the time, I thought, oh, that's really interesting, because in the vast majority of cases, when we speak to someone about, about DR, people have already made some sort of choice. There's usually some sort of factor that's, that's driving, driving them for the, for the project. It might be decommissioning a data center or a desire to move to the public cloud. But in this case, uh, the, the, the particular business were, were kind of evaluating all of the options. And I thought, yes, that's, that's probably, you know, that, it, that is the case. If you, if you have that flexibility, you probably, probably would look at all of those options um, and thought this would be the, the sort of the perfect topic that we could throw over to, to Chris um, at Zerto because Zerto, Fantastic product. Obviously, it's the, the replication product that we build a lot of our uh, DRAS service around, but it's something that can be used in a number of different ways. And there's there's kind of pros and cons of each of those approaches. So we thought we'll bring in our kind of external expert. We'll, we'll get him to to run through all of that. Um, and then the, so the, the the other side of this is is to I guess to to upfront to state our what our preference is. This is the bit in the the YouTube video of someone reviewing a laptop where they say, yep, yeah, I was sent this laptop for free by the, by the company or I'm being paid <laughs> by them. Uh, our, our preference, we're, we're kind of pretty clear about it all over our website is to, to provide DR as a service into the public cloud. We think that's the right option for a whole number of reasons. Um, I'll probably uh, chime in with a, a couple of bits as we go through. Uh, there's, there's, there's reasons we think that's the right way, but obviously it's, it's not perfect in every case. So uh, that with that part out of the way, I'll step aside, I'll hand over to Chris and he can give the, the, the kind of the, the, more, the more unbiased, balanced view. Um, but then, thank you, Chris, I'll, I'll, I'll pass over to you. Yeah, perfect, thanks very much. So um, yeah, thanks everyone for, for joining this morning. I understand it's, uh, you know, hard to give up 30 minutes of your time in any time, any day, but so thanks for joining us. And hopefully you find uh, the session interesting and, and please put your questions as, as, as we mentioned before, because it does make the session you know far better. I'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback and, and, and questions and queries you do have. So, so my name is Chris Rogers. I'm a, I'm a technology evangelist at, at, at Zerto. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be running through, um, you know, DR and, and, and the, um, the architectures today, but also the operating models that are available to us as well. I know, you know, um, we've mentioned, you know, disaster recovery or, or DRAS, you know, the public cloud and private cloud. And but what kind of what does it all mean and what, what, what options are available to people as well as the technical options for, for replicating with Zerto as well. So first of all, like, let's look at some, some challenges that people have, have stated, you know, publicly as, to, as to, to what they fear and what they, what they find is the most challenging pieces of, of disaster recovery. So, you know, this is a, as a, um, a Gartner, um, sorry, as an IDC um, survey. Um, so if we look at like the top three or four here, you know, the IT personnel knowledge and skill is an obvious gap that a lot of organizations do have. You know, traditionally, we probably only test, you know, maybe or do DR once a year on, on maximum. So we, we kind of get out of practice. It kind of falls down the pile of priorities and people don't really, you know, no, I don't think anyone's taking a floral site course or a, or a cloud guru course on disaster recovery and, and disaster recovery testing, right? It just doesn't fall on people's priorities. So eventually skill and knowledge erodes through the business. You know, um, the resource availability, making sure we have enough resource to be able to then um, use the people effectively, you know, making sure that we have enough people who are skilled 
to, to be able to carry out these DR tests and, and, and live fail levels when we need to. And then a few more here, I just want to pick out the recovery time, you know, how long it takes us to actually get back up and running again is a big, big concern for people. Cost and budget. And then I think the biggest one for this, this kind of webinar and the audience is, you know, moving DR to the cloud. That is a big, big challenge. People, people want to do it and organizations see the benefits of, of doing that, but find it a big challenge to do that. And then if we look at the reason people choose DRAS or disaster recovery as a service, as, it, as it's known in the industry, um, there's, there's many, many reasons that people choose disaster recovery as a service and their motivations are normally things like, you know, as I mentioned before, you know the disaster recovery capabilities or or less of, of of the actual organization or the or the staff were there or non-existent you know they weren't up to the, the, the standard they were using a legacy technology such as tape or you know and shipping things off to 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 um to iron mountain for them to store away and things like that some of the other the, the reasons people were using a draz to an, an avoid initial costs for the secondary data center or actually having two dentist data centers that aren't too close together. You know, some people have two HQs that are 50 miles apart. Sometimes that's not good enough. Sometimes it needs to be needs to be um, needs to be further apart than that. And then then the last one there is improve recovery objectives. So massive amounts of of, of changes happened over the last couple of years, um, as we all know, and I'm sure we're all fed up of talking about it now. But a lot of organisations have digitised and gone, you know, gone. Um, have become more reliant on IT systems so therefore their recovery times and recovery point objectives need to you know change with that so then now they're going out to market to look at okay how do I improve my recovery times and my recovery point objectives then as we go a little bit further down the list some bigger bigger um, bit of things here but actually more relevant to a lot of people is you know avoiding that you know hardware storage refresh people choose DRAS because they don't have to go through that cycle of buying more hardware and as we know that is even more uh, more difficult to do now you can't just go and you know to your supplier and say I can have some more storage some more servers please they say yes no worries here's a six month wait time for that you know it's very difficult to order and do capacity management and all that type of thing now because we don't know the lead times and you know who knows what's going to happen in the future with all the things that's going on in the world right now how those lead times might get affected <clears throat> So, so we're going to um, look at the you know, recipes for disaster recovery success. So this is going to have a mix of, as I said, operating models and also some architectures in. So, you know, hopefully we'll kind of be able to blend the two together. So the first one I want to cover today is kind of build your own or, or DIY. If you, you know, you've got your own data centers, you know, typically they're going to be running VMware vSphere or, or Microsoft Hyper-V. Those, those are the typical scenarios that we do see. So building your own data center, very much like going to the shops, Picking up all your shopping, coming home, prepping every single piece of the, the of of the uh, of the meal yourself, you know, chopping everything, cooking everything yourself, right? You're wholly responsible, and that is a whole a single responsibility model most of the time. When you have your own data centers, you're responsible for the data centers, you're responsible for the you know, the racks, the power, the networking, the cooling, all the things that come with that, right? But that does essentially give you control. You know, that gives you the, the ability to control everything and every parameter that you have around it, which sometimes is 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 a good thing. It would require CapEx investment most of the time. You know, you're probably going to need to to buy hardware or, or buy the actual um, the equipment and, and, you know, all the cabinets and all the, all the rest of things. And we're probably going to need dedicated headcount for that type of uh, activity, not just for the DR side of things, but for maintenance, monitoring, security, networking, you know, all the all the peripheral parts that come around it. So when would you want to build your own? Well, if you have an organization that prefer large CapEx investments, then that would be a great opportunity for you to, you know, do DIY disaster recovery, build your secondary data center and, and do it that way. You know, if you already have two data centers already in use, then it would make sense to keep those in place unless you have a plan to, to, to remove one of those or, or all of those. If you already have large IT organizations, if you have a big in-house IT, you can probably, you probably have the, the headcount and potentially the skill involved to be able to deliver that at scale. And if you do prefer to keep the responsibility, you know, in-house or as a solo responsibility model, then build your own would, would suit this. And if we look at the architecture of Zerto, when it comes to kind of on-premise, you know, disaster recovery, I'm going to call it the hypervisor replication, hypervisor disaster recovery, it's very, very simple. So we have, you know, bi-directional, it's one-to-many, it's encrypted, it's in compressed replication. We support a lot of the VMware technology, such as VVOLs, you know, storage vMotion, normal vMotion, all of those things. We don't really have to change the way that you're operating your data centers today to in include Zerto in, in, in your solution suite. The, the replica disks are stored as VMDK files, 
um, so stored in the, in the native format of, of, uh, of a VMware infrastructure. And we have things such as you know cluster management, automatic deploy, automatic removal of the components inside of inside of Zerto, so we can always scale and be right sized for the environment as it comes. And if we look the same for Hyper-V, it's pretty much exactly the same for Hyper-V, right? We're, but we're storing things as VHDX files, as the native file format for Hyper-V. We're completely storage agnostic underneath, and that applies to both VMware and Hyper-V. It doesn't matter what storage you have underneath, we can replicate that there. We have cluster-based deployment again, and again, it is bi-directional, once many, fully encrypted and compressed replication. So it's super efficient um, replication as well. So if we look at the, the architecture, um, you know, we have, we have um, pretty much two components inside of the Zerto ecosystem. So the Zerto Virtual Manager, um, which is, you know, the, the quarterback or the, you know, the management component of the, um, of the solution. And then we have virtual replication appliances, which are essentially the worker nodes, right? They're the ones that replicate the data from site A to site B or wherever, wherever else we're going. So the, the Zerto Virtual Manager is a one-to-one -one relationship with your vCenter server or your SCVMM server. And your VRAs have a one-to-one -one relationship with the amount of hosts you have in the environment. And that's how we achieve our scale, that the more workloads you're running, most likely the more hosts you're running, therefore the more virtual replication appliances we have. And then it, or we can automatically add when you add hosts and automatically remove those appliances when you remove hosts from your site. So that's a very simplistic and a whistle-stop tour of our architecture uh, and, how we, and how we actually set up and, and replicate data. So if we look at the pros and the cons very, very quickly, so it, it, may, it helps you maintain control. If, if you want to maintain control of your disaster recovery environment fully, then it's pretty much you have to build your own, right? You get to utilize your own or, or colo data centers. So if you already have investment in your own data centers or you, you, know, you want to look at colo data centers, you can use those inside of that. You get the choice of where you put your data because essentially you can choose the exact place and the exact rack and cabinet, if you wish, where your data is going to fit. It's probably a more familiar um, deployment and a kind of supporting model than the most that most organizations are used to right this is how it has been done for a long time so the people are more familiar and more more comfortable with that solution and it is a predictable capex right we know what our capex costs are going to be roughly every three five years we, we've been through hardware cycles and everything else like that for uh, for an ongoing amount of time now so we, so if you like capex investment great and i'm going to go over to the con and immediately hit the capex investment right if your organization is more set up for opex infrastructure or you want to be moving towards a more opex uh, operating model then maybe capex isn't the right way for you to go investing in you know millions of pounds in a data center suite probably isn't the way you want to be going if you're looking towards more an operating model uh, an opex operating model it can be inflexible right if you've invested in the data center in the middle of the country and suddenly you want to expand out into you know germany or eu or asia wherever it may be you've got to repeat that in, 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 in another country you can't just pick that up and move that data you can't just easily spin up that in, in a different region somewhere it's going to be very hard to do and relatively inflexible to do you have to worry about capacity and maintenance also it's not just a case of using someone else's infrastructure even if you're in colo you're still you know um responsible for the capacity management the maintenance of that equipment you know all the all the patching and upgrades etc cetera, etc cetera, that come along with that and then you have all the supporting infrastructure that goes along with it it's not just servers and storage you need to need need to uh to run your workloads it's networking it's power it's cooling it's security software it's monitoring software so all those other things that come with owning and operating a whole data center those could be seen as cons as well because it's going to be a little bit more difficult and, and more time consuming to do that and then if we look at disaster recovery as a service. So we have two kind of flavors of disaster recovery as a service. And we're gonna cover both in, in this section, which is you know, self-service and then fully managed. And I would say that disaster recovery as a service is kind of like a spectrum with self-service on, on one end and then fully managed on the other. And you know, I know, you know, um, you know, data barracks will, will kind of help you decide where along that spectrum you wanna go. Um, you don't have to have everything is fully managed by by your service provider, it can, you know, there can be a bit of everything. And, you know, obviously they have the expertise, so fully manages an ideal way to go because they they know what they're doing. But it is a spectrum, right? You don't just have to say, right, I have to do 100% myself or I have to have it 100% done by by service provider. There is, there is you know, levels and, and, and kind of that, that flex in between as well. So self-service strats, you know, it's, it's normally a pre-packaged offering and it, and it usually is software only, right? It's, you see, they're gonna provide you with the, the tooling to do so. But it'd be down to you to potentially set that up or it might, might be additional you know professional services costs or whatever um to kind of set that up and, and do that 
you, the maintenance is still required. You're still required to monitor the service and see how it's going and, and actually do everything. The responsibility will still lie with your organization mainly as well. You're going to be responsible for you know setting up new protection, man, managing and monitoring protection, and probably the invocation as well, and when to invocate, invocate disaster recovery and, and, and testing as well. But then you might be using third party sites for actually replicating that data. So using potentially a public cloud or, or a private cloud in someone else's um, in, in data center to, to be able to replicate that data into. Sorry, and, and it's kind of a, akin to like a bit of like a meal kit, you know, a bit like the, the, the meal kits that are out there today that I get you know, every, every week from through the post. Everything's kind of given to you, but you're still responsible for cooking it. So you can't blame the company if they provide you with great ingredients and you ruin the cooking, right? It is that kind of like the, the half and half piece. So when would you use self-service strats? So if you don't have a secondary site or they're not geographically dispersed enough, then using disaster recovery service is a great way of getting that extra data center in a location you want. Um, you want to move towards an OPEX infrastructure and you know maybe pay as you go off of that disaster recovery piece. You would like to reduce your data center footprint, but you want to maintain overall control. So you still want to have a controlling um, share and a controlling stake in the actual invocation and testing and, and how it's run and everything else like that. And if you already have staff that can help monitor and maintain that that environment and that um, that replication, uh, invocation, etc., then this is going to be a great option for you. But then we have an option of fully, fully managed RAS. And I said there are spectrums in between these things. But if I give you the two ends, you can kind of piecemeal together which pieces you you, you think your organisation is going to is is going to um, benefit from. So the fully managed RAS, I like to kind of envision this as as like you know you're dining out. So everything is cooked for you, prepped for you. You choose exactly what you want. There's even someone who can come along and rec recommend some wine to go with exactly what you've ordered. They compare everything for you and, and you know, fully bespoke. If you have any complaints, any queries, you know, you just ring up the manager. You ask for the manager, your wait, the waiter, whoever it may be, and then they're going to solve every problem that you have along that way. It's fully, you know, white glove service. So normally it's going to be fully managed by your service provider. You know, again, public or private cloud, obviously you know, a lot of, um, Organizations are now looking to public cloud because that's one of the advantages we're going to discuss later on. Such you know, service providers such as data barracks have an amazing service fully backed by public cloud, which gives so much flexibility and, and, and scale as well. You know, it's usually going to be backed by a strict SLA. It's a meaningful SLA when you when you have an SLA with a service provider. And that responsibility is going to lie with the service provider you've chosen. So the the responsibility for that infrastructure and, and that service is going to, you know, fall on, on data barracks in this instance. You know, you get to access vast experience and knowledge. You know, you can upskill your DR strategy and your DR capability incredibly quick, uh, quickly by tapping into the experience and the knowledge that service providers have in this space. Especially someone like Data Barracks, where you know they specialize in this stuff. Right? They do. They they live and breathe data protection, disaster recovery, backup, etc. This is this is what they this is what they do. This is what they specialize in. And then the design, install, ongoing maintenance, monitoring, et cetera, is going to be provided by the provider, right? So even just from the first piece of that, the design installation, you know you're going to get the best design, the best installation services from your service provider as well. So when would you choose fully managed? You know, if you have limited technical personnel or you don't have a big IT team, or you're, or you're even looking to repurpose your IT, IT team members into, you know, you know, Kubernetes and, and cloud and whatever's next, you want to leave disaster recovery to, to, to a service provider, that's a great use case. You know, if you're looking to quickly build uh, BCDR operations, that's going to be a, a very efficient way of doing that by utilizing service provider expertise. If you have, you know, high security requirements, so, you know, you want to maintain the best levels of design, the best level of installation and maintenance, a service provider is going to know that with the tools they choose. If you want dedicated resources, you know you want dedicated people that look after your 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 um your account your your replication services, then fully managed is going to be the way forward for you, and an, an easy onboarding experience as well. When fully managed, it, you know it's pretty hands off from you. You're going to have to have an input into you know what your SLAs are and, and all the other kind of bits and pieces, but the service provider is going to help you pretty much through that process from from an end to end to end perspective. So we look at the the pros and cons. So the pros is you know cutting edge insight, knowledge, and personnel. That I think that's 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 a non-negotiable for me. That that comes with service providers, right? These guys live and breathe this day in day out. They know what they're doing. You know when you have a ransomware attack or a disaster, for you it's the worst possible day that you've ever had, right? For these guys, it's just another day in the office. They know how to deal with it. They're calm, collected, and they make sure that they get you up and running as quickly as possible based upon the plans that they've tested and proven for you, right? So this it's it's one of the biggest pieces of 
of why people choose DRAS for me is is that that knowledge, that personnel, and that that kind of help me. I'm I'm in a I'm in, I'm in a bit of a situation here. The OPEX billing, I think, is a huge, huge bonus, right? Be able to do that pay as you go or pay as you grow type of type of contracts to to enable you to kind of leverage, you know, profit loss and and those those accounts over 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 a long period of time, rather than having to invest millions of pounds in data centers and equipment and everything up front for it to sit there idle for potentially most of the time. You're going to get access to best in class technologies, right? You know. Um, the reason I'm on here today is because Data Barracks has chosen Zerto to, to power their disaster recovery as a service into the public cloud, right? So they're using best in breed technology that you may not have the ability to implement or the ability to execute upon, or even the budget sometimes to be able to, to be able to afford these, you know, the, these um, these technologies or didn't think you could afford. And suddenly now, now they're breaking down, down into a service for you, suddenly it becomes much more affordable and much more easy to, to consume. And then you also get a meaningful SLA. It's not just an SLA that's, you know, <laughs> What your business would like to achieve and if you don't hit it it's oh well and we have to wipe that off the whiteboard next year it, it's it's meaningful right it's backed by contracts and all these other things as well so it's, it's actually meaningful sla and it's, it means something to them and to you as well and then the cons of this would be well we're going to have to relinquish some control right we're going to have to give the service provider our trust and, and and some control of our environment but that doesn't mean it's got to be a bad thing that can actually you know help bolster our, our bcdr ops as, well, as we mentioned earlier it might be a little bit unfamiliar you know, fair enough. If, if we're not, if we're used to having an in-house IT and everything is done in-house, letting a third party into that environment might be a little bit daunting. But again, remember they are bringing the the, the knowledge, the insight, the, the 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 calmness, and everything else that comes with with using a service provider in these in these circumstances. So again, I don't think it's essentially a con, but I had to put something on the right hand side of the screen, right? Again, if if your um, operating model is more capex driven, then opex might not be the best for you. But again, I'm going to say it pretty much, you know, all service providers will have different options for billing as well. Usually OPEX is the preferred method, but I'm sure there is options out there for you to use CapEx investment as well. And it will require probably a strategic change and a strategic mindset change as well. You know, it was probably not going to be an easy decision for IT managers and things to say, I'm just going to bring in a third party that might need higher up, um, you know, kind of strategic decisions to say, actually, we're going to offload this to a third party, to our service provider, but here's the reasons why and here's the benefits, right? It's going to take a little bit more, um, you know, negotiating rather than just going to the same old uh, distributor or whatever and ordering kit and doing the same thing we've always done. We're going to have to change the mindset of, of, of the organization potentially as well. So if we look at public cloud architecture, so we're going to focus on public cloud for, for, for the next few, few slides here. So Microsoft's Azure. Uh, and AWS are pretty much the two most popular public clouds in the UK, um, are the ones that, that Zerto support um, natively as well. So if we take Azure, first of all, I think Azure is probably um, a bit more um, popular in the UK, whereas AWS is a little bit more popular in the US, but I think they're kind of, you know, growing at the same rate and kind of, you know, tip for tat there or thereabouts for both, they're kind of relatively interchangeable. If we look at the Azure architecture with Zerto, we actually have taken a completely new look at how we do replication in, into public cloud. So we've built a purpose-built Zerto cloud appliance. So we haven't just taken what we do on-premise and just transplanted into the cloud and say, that will do. We've actually built this purpose-built. So we use a lot of cloud-native technologies, such as Azure VM scale set workers. We use Azure queues to, to do that. We use cloud storage as well, which is you know nice and cheap for us to use. So we haven't just taken what we do on-premise and put it in the cloud and hope it works. We've purpose built it public cloud to utilize all the technologies that are available to us. Again, it is one to many encrypted and compressed. The replication there fully encrypted and compressed. So it's nice and efficient going in there. And you can use express route or just standard VPN connectivity. There's no requirements for you to use an expensive express route if you don't need to. But if you would like to, we have the option there as well. So again, it's nice and simple, nice and easy for everyone to understand. And if we look at the architecture here, so again, on the production site, we still have the same architecture, Zerto Virtual Managers and Virtual Replication Appliances. But on the right-hand side, we now have our Azure environment. You can see we have our VRA and our ZCA is, is combined inside of that environment there. And then we're using blob storage to store the data. And then if we want, we can use Azure storage to keep an immutable copy of that data for things such as ransomware attacks and things. But we can also have an, a, a, a third copy of the data coming back to your own on-premises environments as well. So if you have a, a smaller incident or something that maybe you don't want to invoke inside of Azure completely, then you can actually roll back inside the environment using the same technology um, behind the scenes of Zerto as well. So giving you lots of flexibility in how you want to um, 
how you want to deploy. You know, these are all interchangeable. So you don't have to do the local copy. You don't have to do the immutable copy. You can just do simple DR to Azure with, you know, one, one line going across. And if we look at the failover process to Azure, so I think this is the re a real, this is where we really <laughs> excel is that we don't actually have any compute in Azure apart from our, our cloud appliance for ongoing replication, right? We're, we're only storing things in, in blob storage, which is, you know, in cloud storage, which is really, really cheap. It's probably one of the, some of the cheapest storage on the planet, right? So we're not actually doing a failover. How do we actually build those virtual machines out for you? So, but this is all automated and orchestrated. So this isn't a manual process anyone has to undertake. Once you've clicked the button to say failover, once you've rung data barriers and said, can you help me failover? This is what the, the Zerto software does automatically for you. So don't feel like this is a, an arduous process you're gonna have to go through manually. This is all under the hood. This is how we do things. So first of all, we clone the replica page blob. So that is the exact copy of the disk that we have from uh, from a week ago, whenever it may be, um, however old we have. So we create an instant clone of the replica. So that is an instant clone, so we can now use that. We read journal data from the block blobs. So this is gonna be the points in time that you actually want to apply. So if it was you know, disaster uh, recovery instance for maybe a power outage or something on those lines, you maybe wanna go back five, 10, 15 seconds before something has happened. So these these uh, journal data are all those checkpoints we have. So as if anyone knows Zerto, we can go back you know, five, 10, 15, 25 seconds previous to something happening and recover from there using our journal. So you read, the, the data from the block blobs using our scale set. So again, the more data you have, the more worker nodes we spin out, which means we can scale with the, with the size of the data, speed up that recovery for you, but don't incur costs when we don't need to, which is which I think is really important. So we, then we write that data into the clone page blob. So we're reading it from the Azure queue and then writing it on top of the replica disk to essentially create the point in time that disk looked like at the point in time you've chosen. And essentially on the fly, we then convert those to VHD import them as managed disks inside of the Azure platform. And then we create the VM exactly as, as it was on premises, attach the, the, the managed disks to the VM and power on the VM. And we'll also power on the VM on the right subnets with the right IP addresses that you've chosen for inside of the workflow as well. So again, that's done for every single VM that you want to recover inside of, um, inside of Azure automatically. So once you've clicked the, the go button, essentially all this is done um, under the hood in incredibly quick times as well. So you should be up and running in, in minutes um, rather than maybe hours or, or days as well. And if we take AWS, it's, it's a very similar story in AWS, right? But just some of the terminology changes because we're changing platform slightly. So essentially we're using a cloud appliance again. We've got scale out import through EBS workers. We've got um, replica and journals are stored in S3 buckets rather than uh, block blob and page for storage. And again, one to many encrypted and compressed as, as we've said all throughout. And we do have direct connect or VPN connectivity. So again, it's pretty much exactly the same, but we're just you know, changing the way we do things with, with, the, with the available technologies that we have. So S3 rather than block blob storage, for instance. And the architecture again, is pretty much identical apart from we're using Amazon and S3 rather than Azure and, and block blob storage. So the, and the failover process, again, it's pretty much identical. But apart from um, deploying the, the worker nodes, we deploy um, recovery EC2 instances deployed first. And then we have Z importer nodes rather than scale set workers, one per disk. We then read the disks from that Amazon S3 bucket and write them directly to the recovery disks. We essentially detach the Z importer from the EBS disk we've created and then reattach those EBS disks to the EC2 instance, which is your virtual machine you're running. And then we power on the instance. Again, all done under the hood without any impact and without any um, need for you to do any of this manually. It's all done um, for you. So the pros and cons of public cloud, well, I think the pros are, are massive here. Elastic scale you know, and, 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 and a global reach as well. So we have, they have data centers pretty much in every corner of the globe. So you don't have to worry about where you want to store your data. They're going to have it everywhere. The lowest cost storage available. When we're doing disaster recovery, most of the time we're storing data in, 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 for large, long periods of time, sat there doing nothing, right? We don't invoke DR every day. So we want to tr try and keep our costs down so we can use the lowest storage possible. 
It also helps us build familiar, familiarity with the public cloud, right? Public cloud isn't going away. It's something that all of us are probably going to be using at some point in the future in some capacity. So it helps you build some familiarity without putting production workloads in there straight away. And doing that with a service provider as well is going to help you even more because they have expertise and knowledge in this area already. The cons. You might need a little bit of training. You know, we might have to upskill some of the staff if they're doing some 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 pieces of of, uh, of public cloud work. The DR invocation costs might be higher because we don't own the infrastructure and compute. We're going to get charged for that when we have to do it, but we are going to save a load of costs without having to run all the infrastructure 24/7 just in case we do need it. But you might need to decommission a data center if you want to use a public cloud. Well, sometimes that can be a con. Okay, it's going to take a lot of work to do that, but the savings and 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 not just in um, in cost, but also in timings are massive on that. And also we need to note that not all workloads are perfectly suited to the public cloud. But again, you can gain expertise from, from data barracks for that, and they'll be able to advise you which workloads are likely to succeed and which workloads are potentially, we need to think of another solution for. But again, most workloads will work in the public cloud absolutely fine. There might just be some edge cases that we might need to work on a little bit more. Um, that's all from me. So I think we're maybe a minute over, but we, we've still got a few minutes for some, if people want to stay online and, and ask any questions. So on that, if we have any questions, I'll um, I'll take them now. And thank you for listening. And I know that was a bit of a whistle stop tour, um, but, but, but thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Chris. In fact, that's actually, that was the first thing I was going to mention. So we've obviously, we've asked Chris to do an awful lot here is to cover all of the architectures, not and, as well as the operating models in, in 30 minutes. Uh, this isn't the first webinar Chris has done with us. He's done a handful, always great. Um, I'll make sure when we do send out the, the follow-up with the recording, I'll inc also include the links to some of the other sessions because we had a, a kind of much, uh, much, much kind of more in-depth deep dive into public cloud architectures. I think last time round, wasn't it? So there's there's yeah. there's, there's other good other good bits to have there. Um, I've, I've got there's been a handful of questions, and I've, some I'm going to kind of summarise into a couple of groups. Uh, the first one is, and I think I know the answer to this already um, because it was something we talked about with the customer, but which so which which of those options offers the fastest recovery speed oh it will it will depend um probably the on-premise vmware to vmware will probably be slightly faster but it will depend on what your definition of fast is right from legacy technology zerto is going to be pretty much faster than most of those available so if you're looking from what you previously have to what you have today you, you no matter what architecture you have you're probably going to uh, um, have a better recovery speed but if you were talking just about the architectures probably the vmware one is going to be quicker but not by a huge ma margin i wouldn't have thought so that was what i thought the, the, the answer still was and uh, and the, re the reason was we, we held actually a um uh, an in-person event with uh with zerto a couple of years ago just just prior to the pandemic and one of the uh, one of the folks that we brought along to present and talk about about Zerto and DR was one of our customers, and that was exactly what they said. So they previously had run Zerto between their own data centers, uh, VMware to VMware. Um, they were decommissioning one, so they they shifted. They moved to, uh, to to DR as a service with us in the public cloud, and that was exactly what uh, what the chap said. He said it, it was ever so slightly slower. You know, the fastest recovery I think you know as you say is, is in your own data centers and it's VMware to VMware, but even for this kind of marginal increase, it was still well within the you know the, the SLAs that they'd set with the business. So they were they were really happy about it for all the other reasons. Um, and then the, so the other question that we had is around cost, and it's which which of these options is the lowest cost, which is a is a, a can of worms. Yeah, it absolutely can of worms. So I'll try and be quick and summarise. Um, I would if depending on if you take all costs considered, I would say public cloud is going to be the cheapest for disaster recovery, just because. For the majority of customers, DR isn't something that happens every day. You know, probably not even once a year they actually invoke DR for real. Um, and if you do control tests, and you can, you know, you can keep costs down by keeping the time you do testing um, to to a minimum. Um, but if you don't have to order hardware, keep data centers alive, monitor, manage staff, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, those probably things are going to massively outweigh the costs of running some some compute for a few weeks a year inside a public cloud and, and some and some cloud storage. So I'd probably say the economics work best in, in public cloud, but that will depend on each organization's individuality. I would say if you already have investment in data centers and things, then that, that cost model might change. Um, but if you're looking purely from from a, a traditional infrastructure, if you did one from the other and buying them outright, I would say that the public cloud would probably come out on top. That okay. so that I was going to say share share another story from our um, experience on that. I, I agree. I think I think that probably is the case in the vast majority. We certainly found um, so we've previously run 
a, a DRAS service into our own data centers. Uh, the cost was able, you know, we were able to reduce it when we moved into the public cloud. But with that being said, and, and Chris noted it earlier, the invocation costs are higher. So the good thing about Zerto is that you're keeping your processing cost in the public cloud very low, you know, for the for the day-to-day -day regular replication. When you do invoke, um, and we had a, a customer that had a, a ransomware incident last year, and they actually ran for a, a, a pretty long period of time in the public cloud, did a did a migration into a you know new hardware when they were kind of coming coming back out of that invocation and the the, the monthly cost in the cloud was pretty high um, now that the thing that was a, a benefit to them at the time is that was something that they were able to claim on their insurance it was a it was a a, a, a business interruption cost uh, and that all got claimed back so it's it, it does change the flex of it and as you're right most most people don't run for an extended period in dr per year so it, it, it tends to bring it down um yeah. Got sort of got a handful of other ones. Yeah, no here. problem. Enjoying the questions. Question. Yeah, we've got a question here, which um, there's this is interesting actually because it's, it's it's a couple of questions about kind of variable SLAs depending on which setup you would have. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, again, the, the thing that kind of occurs to me in, in a lot of these cases, I think there's and, and in the way that we've um, operated the service across you know multiple models, whether it's into a, a kind of VMware vCloud environment versus in the public cloud, the SLA wasn't drastically different. The, the thing that tends to, for us, when we implement it for a customer, have an impact on on what SLA you're able to deliver is uh, kind of factors based on the customer environment. So things like bandwidth, things like particular uh, site, you know, very very large um, database servers, for instance, that has an impact. And there's a you know typically also the servers you can get back in. Uh, 15 minutes this one's going to take longer because of the nature of it um and you can test and improve but but um tends to be the impact but i would say there's probably not a, a, a drastic difference in 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 sla based on the model here or the architecture it, it tends you know the, the the thing that for us is is the bigger factor is is the you know what it is that you're protecting and, and kind of the, the nature of that uh, oh and then this is an interesting question um <laughs> I mean, I guess the answer, it's going to be a very easy answer for you. How reliable is the conversion between hypervisors, e.g., VMware to, to Azure? Uh, incredibly. Um, we're probably one of the. F I think we, we might have even been the first to be able to to do that type of um, replication without having to rehydrate backups and change formats and things. Um, we've been honing the technology for, for ever since our inception. Pretty much, we've always been able to do across hypervisor so from vmware to hyper v hyper v to vmware as well so we used to be able to mold and change the data sets um so actually it it I mean the data barracks you can kind of answer <laughs> for, but i've never yeah, seen I, I, i've never no, seen no, it no. fail right i've never seen exactly. a conversion fail yeah i'd say that was why i think it was such an interesting question for me um uh, yeah it's it's not something I think, I think we've ever had an issue with at all so yeah i assume it's, it's pretty, pretty pretty bulletproof um no, very good. Um, so we do have a couple of other questions that are here, but I'm I'm always very cognizant of, as Chris said at the start, it's difficult to take time out. We don't want to run uh, run too long. Um, if we've not managed to get to your question, I promise we will get back to you individually and 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 send through an answer over email later on. Um, but I, I just want to wind things up quickly today and say thank you very much again, Chris, for for taking the time to uh, to run through all of this. Um, thank That's you everyone pleasure. for joining us, and uh, and we hope to see you on the on the next webinar very soon.